Good evening or good morning, depending on what your time zone is. Welcome to today's event on the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. I won't go into any introduction at all to give our speakers the maximum time uh, possible. So I'm just going to jump straight into the introductions. Um, and just a quick note that Yoram Hazoni will be joining the call slightly later and is our last speaker. So first we'll be hearing from Bogla uh, Fanny um, Palco, who is a CSS alumna living in Tel Aviv and is also the director of reconciliation at an Israeli fintech firm. Before uh, Fanny made Aliyah to Israel, she started her career in Hungary's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ophir Ziegelman is an alumna of CSS's 2023 Caledonia Fellowship and works as a senior technology executive. He formerly served as a senior intelligence officer in the office of the Israeli Prime Minister and was a team commander of an elite Israeli intelligence technology unit. And finally, as I mentioned already, Dr. Yeram Hazoni, who will join us later on the call, is a senior CSS fellow, award-winning political theorist, and the president of the Herzl Institute in Jerusalem. He's also the author of numerous books, including Conservatism, A Rediscovery, which was published recently. Each speaker will have uh, around 10 minutes to make their opening remarks, and this will be followed by a Q&A. So if you can submit your questions in the chat throughout, um, we'll take those questions after each of our speakers um, has had a, an opportunity to put forward their opening remarks. So very briefly, I will just begin by saying that this is um, one of the most important conversations I think we can be having right now, um, given the fact that there is uh, so much, uh, so many weeds um, around this issue and so many people, particularly in Western countries, who are unwilling to um, believe evidence that is put before their noses, but are quite willing to um, simply take Hamas's word for it. So we are very honoured to be able to hear from those Israelis um, who are on the ground. So um, I'll begin by um, uh, allowing um, Fanny to take the floor to begin her opening remarks. Thank you, Emma. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the whole Common Sense Society and, and Orshi from Hungary, uh, specifically for inviting me and allowing me to talk to all of you. Um, I am no political or security expert. I'm a local here in Tel Aviv, actually in Giba Time next to Tel Aviv. I work in Tel Aviv. I work in high tech and live a very regular everyday life. And I thought a lot, what could I say as a non-expert, non-political or security expert? So I decided that I'm going to share with you all my personal experience from three different perspectives as quickly as I can. Um, the first perspective is the perspective of the individual, what the impact of these events are on me. And I want to take you back to October 6, actually, that was until now in my life, the happiest day of my life, because... My partner, asked, my, my partner proposed to me on October 6 in the evening. We were overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. We went for a wonderful celebratory dinner. It was Simhat Torah in Jerusalem. Everyone was celebrating. We went close to midnight to the Western Wall. We prayed for our future family. We prayed for health. Little did we know that we should have prayed for peace. We should have prayed for the lives that will be taken in just a couple of hours. In the morning, while I was getting ready for breakfast, uh, we heard the first sirens wailing. Uh, I thought it was a joke. I'm not kidding. I look at Jerusalem as my hometown in Israel. I lived there for years. Um, the last time I remember I had a, a red alert, a siren there, was I think 2014. Uh, I thought it was a mistake. I didn't believe that that was a real siren. Um, then another came and another, and my my fiance told me that he sees it that there is a war broke out, that we have an actual attack on the country. At the time, we didn't know the extent of this attack. We only knew we we sort of thought that, and I'm I'm very very sorry to say this, but we thought it's the regular. They are you know shooting at us a few rockets, and in a couple of days it will be over. We did not know at the time what will unfold in the Otef Gaza region and in Sterot specifically. Um, 
it took us hours to actually make our way back home because we could not leave the hotel. It's a 37 minutes ride from Jerusalem to our home, which signifies how small this country is, I think, to everyone. And it was the longest 37 minutes of my life. I prayed all through the drive um, that there won't be sirens. And my partner told me that if there are sirens, please don't panic. We are going to stop on the road. You are going to get out of the car, lie on the floor, lie on the ground, and just cover your head. The first signs that something much bigger was going on was when on the way home, we had a roadblock and they were actually looking for suspects. By the time we got home, we realized that at least a hundred people were dead. At the time, it, it was the TV was only showing a hundred. I remember that day um, we were talking in the evening and I asked my fiance, what do you think, how bad it is? Do you think there will be a lot of dead? And he told me 300. He believes it will be around 300 and that's horrible. Few days later, that number went up to 1,300. When we got home and we checked on all family members, I did what I had to do. I enacted the protocol that my company has in case of an emergency. And this is where the perspective of the community comes in. The second perspective is the perspective of the community. We need to call all of our employees and make sure that they are safe and sound and accounted for. I never wish to anyone to have to call your colleagues to make sure that they are safe and sound, that their family members are okay. I was lucky because my, my team members were safe, although one of my team members' brother was barricaded for 16 hours in his safe room because he was from near Am, a kibbutz that was only saved because their heroic guard realized, security guard realized that something was going on and armed the neighborhood patrol, and they were defending in an actual battle their own kibbutz. But my team member didn't know for hours if she will see her brother again or his brother's wife. His brother's wife is in shock and since then is not talking. I was a lucky manager from the perspective of the community because another manager messaged me and said, we are not finding one of the team members. That team member I saw on Thursday. He stayed over time because he was going to the music festival and he knew that he's going to come late on Sunday. And neither his family, no one could locate him. His body was found next to his, be next to his best friend three days after the events. He was murdered. From the perspective of the community, I don't wish to anyone to have to have a meeting with your team managing the logistics to go to your colleague's funeral. A young, bright, smiley boy who just literally, you saw him a couple of days ago running down the corridor in the office because he was murdered alongside hundreds of other people. And I do want to tell everyone, if you don't know this about Israel, Israel is a very small country. It might be 9 million people, but it's the third of the size of Hungary. Everyone knows everyone. It's not just my colleague. Through my partner, through my fiance, we have heard and were impacted by multiple deaths and every single family in this country is impacted, whether directly or indirectly. It is a collective trauma. Every year I remember my family members who died in the Holocaust, and I never thought that never forget, never again, will be reality for me. Now, the generation, the, the, the trauma that I have in my DNA became my reality. I couldn't believe that this happened in 2023 to us. And the third perspective is the perspective, the international perspective. If you read my bio, you saw that in my previous role, I was a, a director at a, a company that has an office both in Jerusalem and in Ramallah, Palestine, the Palestinian Authority. I managed a team that had both Palestinian and Israeli team members. And I did this because I truly believed in what our founder, um, Zvi Schreiber, who's a British businessman, said that the only way to build 
peace, future peace, is through economic cooperation. I always, with an open arm, waited for my Palestinian colleagues. And I truly believe that through building things together, through working on technology together, they will understand us and we will understand them better. This was undermined with every conflict that we had in the past. But what broke my trust almost 100% now is when I see what my former colleagues are posting on LinkedIn, not on Facebook, not on Instagram, on LinkedIn, a professional site. They are justifying the murder, the rape, the abduction of my people. It means that they would justify their movement with my death. And that is something that the, the level of, it's not even disappointment. I don't, don't know, I, I, can't, I can't remember right now for a word that describes well how I feel right now, how I raised a team there, how I raised the manager how I always listen to them. And I truly believe that if we are empowering the other side, they will hold us dear as well. And they will see that there is there is there there are people to work with. And I, right now, after seeing what they really believe and in these case, in these situations, truth, everyone's true face shows, I can't. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fanny, for your um, comments there and also for sharing your personal experiences. I know that must be really difficult for you. Um, we're now going to hear from um, Ophir Ziegelman, who I introduced um, already. And just a quick note that there is at the bottom of your screen a Q&A chat box if anybody wants to put their questions in there that we'll return to when we get to the Q&A um, after we've heard all of our speakers. Thank you, Ophir. First of all, thank you to the Common Sense Society for organizing this uh, important uh, event. October uh, 7th uh, was many things, but I think it was first and foremost an attack on the Jewish state and on the Jewish people. And in light of that, I wanted to offer uh, three thoughts on Jewish history, uh, Jewish strategy, and Jewish leadership uh, in this time. So I'll start with uh, Jewish history. October 7th um, was the deadliest uh, attack on, on Jewish life, lives, on Israeli lives, uh, since the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. And I think it touched a deep nerve in Jewish memory, uh, in Jewish history. Uh, some of the scenes that, that we've, we've, we've seen, we've heard of, of uh, kids, uh, babies getting kidnapped from their crib uh, are, are uh, reminiscent of, of stories that we've heard about uh, from the Holocaust, as, as Fanny mentioned. And uh, the devastation of peaceful communities reminds one of some of the worst pogroms in Eastern uh, Europe. And in the past few days, I found myself going back to uh, a poem uh, that was written by Israel's national poet, Haim Nachman Bialik in 1904. Um, and the name of the poem is In the City of Slaughter. And that poem uh, was written on the Kishinev pogroms in 1903. And I'll read uh, just a few of the first words uh, that I think are both chilling and, and, and timely. Uh, Get up and walk through the city of the massacre and with your hand touch and lock your eyes on the cold brain and clots of blood. Dried on tree trunks, rocks, and fences, it is they. Go to the ruins, to the gaping breaches, to walls and hurts, shattered as though by thunder. And when you read those words, uh, those words could have been written um, last week. And, and I think this, um, this event, um, is going to shape Israeli uh, society, Israeli defense thinking, and Israeli politics uh, for decades uh, to come. And uh, for once, I think Israeli citizens will need to feel uh, safe and secure uh, within their national borders again. Uh, the, the Jewish state failed in doing uh, the, the primary objective of the state, 
which is to secure its uh, citizens. And, and also, um, in the face of evil, I think many Israelis ask themselves, how can they confront an, a diabolic ideology that cherishes uh, death over life? I got to serve to do my military service in the intelligence at the wake of the second uh, intifada uh, between uh, 2002 and 2005. Uh, just before those events, there was a, 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 a lynching. Uh, there were suicide bombers and there were lynches. And, and one event uh, caught a lot of attention. It was a, an event where two reservists uh, were kidnapped into, uh, two Israeli reservists uh, were kidnapped into Ramallah and lynched. And the photos were broadcasted. And I remember many of my friends uh, looking at that and just being horrified by the barbarity of the event. And I've heard many, uh, many of the same friends in the past uh, week and a half uh, trying to grapple with the same, with the same uh, questions about uh, just facing evil and facing barbarity, um, you know, and looking at it. But, but beyond that, I think the other historical implication is that uh, this is Israel's largest intelligence uh, failure uh, since 1948, uh, in my opinion, uh, bigger than the Yom Kippur War intelligence failure in 1973. And, and that's, um, at least in my opinion, when you consider the unparalleled access to information and intelligence uh, that Israel today has, uh, the much more sophisticated intelligence tools and then the fact that Gaza is in Israel's uh, backyard, really. And um, I, I remember from my service in the intelligence, one of the learnings from the Yom Kippur War, which happened uh, 50 years ago, was the formation of, of a devil's advocate unit within the intelligence. And that unit was supposed to challenge dogma, challenge the majority opinion, to make sure that uh, there's always discussion and intelligence uh, failures are prevented. Uh, that didn't help uh, this time. And, and I see this event as changing Israeli intelligence, uh, both processes, ga gathering um, approaches and organizations uh, for many, many years to come. I think there's also there was also uh, Israeli complacency um, against Hamas uh, up to a week before the October 7th attack. Uh, it seemed that the the head of the intelligence were making the point that Hamas was uh, so-called deterred, and that it, at this point in time was mostly interested in monetary incentives. And uh, now we know that, that 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 wasn't correct. But beyond beyond Jewish history, I think this is an important moment for Jewish uh, strategy, and uh, the challenge that the Israeli leadership is facing right now is extremely daunting. And in the past few days, I've heard uh, General David Petraeus, commander of American forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, who happened to just publish a book about uh, warfare history since 1945, uh, described this as maybe the uh, the most uh, daunting um, warfare challenge since, uh, since World War II. Uh, and that's when you consider the fact that uh, Gaza uh, is about twice the size of Washington, D.C., it has uh, over 2 million uh, in, in civilian population. And the Hamas uh, terrorists uh, don't, wear, don't wear uniform. Uh, they hide within mosques. They hide within hospitals. They hide within uh, schools. And, um, and they've been probably planning uh, this attack for months. So uh, as the IDF will, seems likely will go into the Gaza Strip, it will face uh, suicide bombers. It will face uh, booby traps. Uh, there, there's a whole city of tunnels that was built underneath the Gaza Strip, and where that's that's where a lot of uh, money that was supposed to, supposed to go to uh, welfare of the people of Gaza went to. And in those uh, bunkers, in those tunnels, there are weapons, and probably there are the hostages uh, themselves that that um, are hidden there. So the IDF will need to do all of that while uh, trying to avoid opening a second front in the north with Hezbollah, and then potentially a third front in uh, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. And I've, I've even, even uh, heard experts talk about a potential fourth front uh, with Syria, with some of the Iranian militias that are there, and, and avoid uh, a direct confrontation with Iran itself. So this is an extremely uh, difficult and daunting uh, leadership uh, challenge. 
And, and there's also, I don't know that there is currently a, a clear view on what comes after the war, what is the objective. Uh, the two options uh, for Gaza that are on the table uh, doesn't seem to be good options. Uh, one is to uh, take, for the IDF to take over Gaza. Uh, I'll remind the audience that uh, the IDF withdrew from Gaza in 05, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite uh, to want to take Gaza back. And the other option, assuming that Hamas is, uh, is eradicated and expelled from the Gaza Strip is uh, to try and do uh, regime change, to try and bring back uh, the PLO. The PLO uh, lost uh, in Gaza to Hamas in 07, and obviously that requires the, the Gazan people to want to be ruled by the PLO. So this is an incredibly uh, difficult moment, difficult questions, and those questions will play out in the next few weeks and months. And finally, I'll say a word about Jewish uh, leadership, Jewish and Israeli leadership. Uh, this is a moment, uh, Israel is a strong country, and this is a moment of incredible unity. In fact, I don't remember ever seeing such Israeli unity in my lifetime. Uh, it's, it was incredible to see up to October 6, uh, the country was still divided over domestic political issues, uh, judicial reform, uh, there were some flashpoints with state and religion. All of that is completely um, gone out the window. Um, People are rallying solidarity, and their aim is to win uh, this war. And, and they're also unlikely uh, heroes and leaders that have emerged uh, during this time. And I'll, I'll mention one of them. Uh, it's a lady called uh, Rachel from uh, a, village, uh, a town called Ofakim. And she just made it to the uh, front cover of the New York Times, and she met uh, President Biden because she, once the terrorists took over her house, uh, she was with her husband taken hostage, uh, for 17 hours, she fed the terrorists uh, cookies and fed them lunch and talked to them because she understood that she needed to buy time until the IDF soldiers uh, will rescue her, uh, which uh, they eventually did. So she is now a national hero. Her image became an uh, animation and she's on posters and she, she became a symbol of, of Israeli uh, resolve uh, during this hard time. And of course, there are the many um, Israeli policemen and soldiers that on October 7th uh, rushed into those communities uh, to try and defend civilians. Many of them lost their lives in doing so. And uh, they are heroes that will be telling their stories for many years to come. Uh, so to conclude, I'll say that, you know, uh, Israel is, um, is a strong country. And as I said, uh, I believe Israel will eventually prevail. And the communities that were shattered and devastated uh, will be rebuilt. And I think that will be the ultimate uh, victory uh, for Israel. Thank you. Now we will hear from Dr. Yoram Mazzoni. Thank you very much for your comments, Ophir. Uh, Yoram, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Hi there. How muted am I now? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let me begin by by uh, adding a few comments about the, the condition of Israeli society. Uh, Fanny's right. Um, every, everyone in Israel is, is directly, personally uh, involved um, in in my family, I have uh, a nephew whose uh, closest friend was killed at the uh, was murdered at the uh, at the music festival. I have a first cousin uh, whose uh, longtime uh, partner, former partner, is a hostage in Gaza. Um, I have a son and three nephews on the front line, and uh, many other family members who have been called up and and who are in the service at the, at the moment. So um, I, I don't believe that uh, my experience is any different from anybody else's. Everyone in Israel is uh, directly tied into this, and everyone in Israel um, understands the uh, the understands and feels the historical connections to uh, to the Holocaust and to the purpose of the state of Israel, which is to uh, allow Jews to be able to um, defend themselves and to make sure that uh, atrocities against Jews don't go on unanswered. It's a it's a very um, special moment because um, 
surprisingly, the, 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 there is something positive in, in the midst, midst of all of these horrors, uh, which is that the, um, the, the, the people of Israel are unified you know, almost the entire Jewish people throughout the world <clears throat> unified in a way that we haven't seen in many, many years. Um, there, there's uh, no daylight between the Israeli left and the Israeli right in terms of assessing what happened, in terms of uh, war aims, um, you know, what, what maybe used to be considered to be a, 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 a fringe right wing kind of a demand that Israel, excuse me, um, that Israel eliminate uh, the Hamas down to a man, that's simply the policy of the Israeli government. We have a unity government at this point. Um, uh, one of the left of center parties is in the government and others may join. And uh, the, the goal of uh, uprooting and eliminating uh, the Hamas is uh, is everyone's goal. There is there. There's no question about it. There's no doubt about it. Uh, our our usually very active uh, democratic uh, public life uh, does doesn't doesn't do, isn't reflecting any significant distinctions uh, on on this point. Um, as of Ophir said, it's uh, nobody thinks this is going to be uh, an easy war. The, the soldiers are being told to uh, prepare themselves for, for a war that uh, could go on for months uh, and uh, perhaps even longer than that. The um, principal question, though, is, is not whether Israel is going to win, win the war. Uh, uh, the Israeli uh, mobilization is an order of magnitude larger than, than anything that the Hamas can, uh, can field. The Hamas will be... Uh, uprooted and defeated. The problem is, uh, first of all, how many casualties uh, we'll sustain, how, how many of our sons and daughters are, are going to be uh, lost in this battle. And that introduces very difficult questions of trade-offs. There are ways to, uh, to protect our soldiers, but they inevitably involve um, a, a tremendous amount of damage to the, uh, to the civilian population in, in, in Gaza. Uh, the Netanyahu government, um, the unity government has uh, acted correctly, in my view, uh, by repeatedly calling for civilians to uh, to move to the southern part of the Gaza Strip, uh, opening the uh, the north and Gaza, Gaza City for uh, open warfare uh, in under conditions in which uh, you know we would obviously prefer to not be harming civilians, but in order for that to happen, the civilians have to move. Uh, to the south, uh, that that uh, reflects a uh, opens up a problem which I think is important for understanding the entire conflict. Uh, Israel is interested in minimizing civilian casualties on both sides, but for the Hamas, uh, they're they're very well aware that every civilian casualty in Gaza is a propaganda advantage for them. And we've seen in the last couple of days with this false claim that Israel uh, targeted a, a hospital in, in Gaza, uh, we've seen that there are hundreds of thousands of people in uh, not, not only throughout the, the Muslim world and the Arab world, uh, but also throughout the West, who are uh, longtime Hamas sympathizers. Now, we always thought that those Hamas sympathizers, um, that they were, you know, just uh, subscribing in principle to the idea that, you know, that that uh, uh, the uh, Palestinian Arabs should should not be abused or that they should be given independence on in part of the land of Israel. Uh, but it it turns out that um, that these Hamas sympathizers, which you know, include very very large sections. Of, uh, of of the progressive left. I'm not saying everyone, but large sections and very prominent figures um, are unwilling to, to condemn. And in fact, in many cases are enthusiastically cheering uh, the most horrible atrocities 
uh, and it's very difficult to conclude if you you know if you, you don't have to be Jewish to conclude this if you're any kind of decent person of of common sense whether you're you're Christian or Hindu or Muslim or an atheist you, you ought to be able to to understand that uh, that at this moment cheering uh, cheering uh, atrocities uh, of the Nazi variety um, makes you into something that we didn't think we had in the West. We, you know, we, we didn't believe that there are parts, portions of our political spectrum, significant portions uh, that are uh, undeterred, in fact, enthusiastic about uh, Nazi methods of um, uh, seeking the destruction of the, of the Jewish people or of any people. Uh, but we have such a population, we have such a uh, political faction, and that places pressure on all of our, all of the friendly governments that, that might want to help Israel. The dynamic that, you know, is inevitable is that as Israel proceeds with, uh, uh, with its seeking its, its war aims, that this propaganda machine is going to be uh, turning large sections of the international left by the way, uh, there are certain uh, th there's a certain segment, uh, smaller and less significant, but real on uh, on the political right, which is uh, also sympathetic to the Hamas and and to the slaughter of Jews. And um, what what we're expecting is a is a protracted uh, struggle, not just on the ground. With the Hamas, you know, maybe with the Hezbollah if they decide to to, to join, but uh, also protra a protra protracted <clears throat> diplomatic and public relations struggle, and you know these are not just words. The purpose of the diplomatic and public relations assault on Israel uh, by by pro Hamas uh, activists and organizations. The purpose of it is to choke off. Um, Israel's ability, for example, to be resupplied uh, in in munitions. Uh, Israel is an independent country, but it doesn't manufacture uh, every kind of weapon system that uh, that it needs, and certainly not in the kinds of quantities that are going to be necessary. And so, although I, I don't think anybody in Israel wants to see uh, American soldiers uh, uh, fighting for us, we 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 don't need American soldiers fighting for us, but um, as in the Falklands War, when uh, the United States um, uh, set up a, a long resupply operation to uh, make sure that British forces fighting their war um, would have the munitions that they needed, Israel is going to need that kind of support from the United States. And the, the danger uh, in this situation is that um, that as the international media uh, turns against Israel and goes back to, excuse me, goes back to condemning Israel uh, for supposedly for for you know for its atrocities and making the equivalency between Israel and uh, and the Hamas, as that happens, there there is a danger to Israel that um, that the threat of cutting off. Uh, munitions resupply or you know uh, uh allowing the united nations and other international organizations to engage in sanctions against against israel that, that will make it impossible for israel to freely conduct a war that everyone in israel knows it must conduct and according to rules that are not going to be controversial in israel but may be controversial for people who don't live in the middle east and don't have experience with this kind of warfare so um, to sum up, uh, we're facing a, uh, a long and different, a difficult battle. The talk of sending US, US troops into battle uh, doesn't make sense from an Israeli perspective, uh, but we, we do need, uh, we're going to need um, uh, resupply of munitions and uh, diplomatic cover and various other things that uh, that uh, the United States and European countries can assist us with, and everyone should understand that that wherever you are, when you're you're facing this propaganda machine, you're actually a part of the war itself. 
and uh, you know we very much uh, appreciate and and hope for the assistance of uh, sympathetic friends and allies uh, throughout the world. Thank you, Yoram. Um, I'm going to kick off the Q&A by asking my own question, but it's because through conversations that I've had with numerous people this week, um, I think I asked this on behalf of many non-Jewish um, Brits. I have personally been horrified to see just how many anti-Semites there are living among us on our streets carrying Hamas or um, other Islamic Jihad uh, flags. We've seen the moral equivalence that the BBC has made by refusing to refer to Hamas as a terrorist organization, choosing to refer to them as militants instead. And all of those people who would normally come out and, and condemn the abuse of the disabled, the elderly, women, um, and even migrants' rights activists have been completely silent about the fact that Hamas have murdered the disabled, raped women, and so on. Um, and I, I think that there's been a real wake up for many people in Western countries that that old hatred and that sort of bloodlust, I think, is the only way that you could really put it, that leads to a pogrom of this sort. And I think we should refer to it as a pogrom rather than just purely as a terrorist attack. How is that? You know, the sight of um, in the West, in you know, Sydney, people shouting gas the Jews, um, in American universities, anti-Semitic chants. Um, also, you know, ho various horrible things have happened here in the UK, including one man with an Israeli flag uh, allegedly being threatened to be beheaded with a knife when he attended a, a rally, a, a pro-Palestinian rally here in London. How is that being received by Israeli citizens? What are Israelis thinking when they see that these, these countries that in their minds are Western allies are actually full of an awful lot of anti-Semites? And obviously it's the minority of the populations in these countries, but it's still a significant and disturbing number of people. And I'm interested to get your thoughts on, firstly, how you feel seeing this, but also how the Israeli population are receiving that. If if Yoram wants to start, and we can go in reverse order. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I have something uh, important to say about this. Um, I, I, in in my circles, there, were, there was never any doubt that, that uh, uh, that there was uh, significant anti-Semitism, uh, especially on the progressive left. Um, so nothing, nothing that's happening is uh, surprising to me. But you know uh, that that doesn't mean it's not surprising. Ophir, I've I've been especially disappointed with uh, American universities. Um, I was involved uh, last week with uh, issuing on behalf of the Harvard, Harvard Club of Israel, which is the official Harvard alumni club for uh, Israeli, Israelis, um, a letter voicing our disappointment specifically uh, with what, ha what happened at, on Harvard campus, uh, which was a letter signed by over 30 student organization that basically uh, blamed uh, the Hamas attack on, on Israel. And then, uh, and then the the institutional response was uh, late. It was uh, timid, and it evoked um, moral equivalence uh, between the victim and the perpetrator in trying to uh, call for dialogue. But um, it struck me that at, at the wake of so this event is um, Israel's nine eleven. And in fact, as, as several commentators have mentioned, several order bigger uh, relative to the Israeli population compared to 9-11 was for the American population. And, um, and the institutional instinct to look at an event that is equivalent to 9-11 and not be able to condemn it right away, uh, but require uh, a donor from, uh, a pressure from donors, pressure for faculty, and some some weird negotiation between the, the 
the, the student and the alumni community and the university to get to something that's that's a reasonable moral, um, you know, uh, clarification. I I found that a very troubling, and um, I, I I think that there is a, uh, as you all mentioned, there's already been a, a climate of anti-Semitism in some of those um, institutions, academic institutions, but I think this is a watershed moment especially for many Israelis that I know that are questioning whether they should go and study in, the, in those institutions and whether uh, Jewish life on campus uh, is, is safe, despite a lot of language on inclusion and diversity um, that doesn't seem to apply in the case of, of Jews in this case. Um, Fanny, specifically, we've seen here in the UK, there were four Jewish schools in North London that weren't able to open. We've seen schools also in the Netherlands that weren't able to open. When Israelis see that Western countries, where many of them will have family members, see that those countries, when faced with this kind of virulent anti-Semitism, are not really doing anything meaningful to stand up for their Jewish population. How does that make Israelis feel? Is that making the Israeli population feel even more isolated? I think yes. The short answer here is yes. It makes us feel more isolated, but it is not surprising to anyone here. Like I honestly can say in my friend circle, at my workplace, no one is surprised that our diaspora is not protected, that many European countries have apparently not learned enough from history. Uh, I think what's the most difficult for Israelis to see, for me personally to see, is how some people are claiming that this is a complex issue. And because this is a complex issue, I don't want to say anything. And for once in my life, I think, because I'm a devil's advocate, I will, you know, uh, argue for both sides if needed. Uh, this is, the, I don't think there is complexity in the beheading of babies. I don't think there is complexity in burning alive children. I don't think there is complexity in rape. And somehow, now on the West, the biggest feminist, you know, speakers who speak out against everything somehow remain silent. That's okay. If it's, it's not okay to rape, to murder, to etc., except if it's an Israeli, if it's a Jew. And I think that is now. I don't think Israelis were living in a la la land about thinking that anyone will, you know, defend us. This is why we need to defend ourselves. This is why we cannot count on anyone else. We need to make sure that we take care of our future. But it is definitely now shedding a light on a much, much bigger evil that surfaced, surfacing itself. And I wanted to just add the personal angle because I'm, I think here, the per the one who, who represents that. I studied with I studied at Hamburg University, which is known to be a very left wing university in Germany. Uh, but nevertheless, I I made great friends, and uh, I can tell you a lot of them checked on me since the start of the war. Uh, but of course, people were congratulating on the engagement, and I of course messaged a few people that I will be happy to see them at my wedding. To which, from someone, I received the answer that. Even if the war is over, she would never step foot in this country. This is a person I studied with. This is a person I helped to prepare for exams. And it really, right now, the way I feel, and I think a lot of, especially um, uh, Olim, uh, like me, people who immigrated to Israel, who lived the majority of their life until now in a in different place, in another country, we feel betrayed. We were friends. We we count on these people as our friends. And now I thought about this. I read about it uh, online, but I it really resonated with me. When I was a teenager, me and my friends used to play this game. How would you have hid yourself in the Holocaust? Which is a very morbid game, but as Jewish offspring, you do run that thought. Like, how would I have survived? And I realized that the people I counted as my friends in Hamburg 
many of them would have not hidden me. Many of them would have not done anything. Many of them would have watched me being wagoneered and sent to a concentration camp because this is what it means to me. This is the betrayal of what I feel when these people are now telling that it's okay that the pro-Palestine movement right now is violently uh, protesting, justifying rape, murder, kidnapping. And they are saying, or they are saying that this is a complex issue. So I'm not saying anything. I think there was, uh, I can't remember who put this up on Twitter, but somebody did point out that um, it's horrifying to see just how many people would have been those standing by watching Jewish people being loaded onto cattle trucks and then excusing it by saying, well, they did undermine the Jewish economy. I'm so sorry to hear that, Fanny. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Combined with the sense of betrayal, there's also this, the, the idea of land for peace has been completely undermined by this because it's clear that withdrawing from territories does not result in peace. Um, so maybe this is more of a question uh, for Ophir. What does the future of Israel look like strategically given that land for peace has been undermined? And then this growing international isolation. And I'll just, I'll join this with another one of um, the questions from our Q&A. Um, with sit this, I'll read it out directly. With sitting members of Congress openly supporting Hamas and Biden committing 100 million in aid to Gaza, um, is the US support for Israel in jeopardy? So what does the future of Israel look like in these terms? Well, I'll start from the second part. I think the U.S. support for Israel seems to me at least uh, the strongest that it's been in, in, in decades. Uh, they're currently, I mean, President Biden just visited Israel. Uh, there are military assets that have been mobilized, including two aircraft carriers uh, in the east to the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and uh, the President President Biden uh, referred to the the idea that uh, another country in the region will try to attack Israel by saying uh, don't. So that seems to me a very strong support. Um, I think uh, as, as the war progresses, as Yoram uh, mentioned, I think um, th there might be some erosion politically of that support uh, in the US, but so far it's been very strong. Um, in terms of the, the broader, what is the end game um, for, uh, for peace in the region. Stepping back and, and asking what, what was the motivation of Iran, of Hamas to, to plan and conduct this attack uh, in this particular moment, uh, one of the obvious reasons is the uh, normalization um, process that has, has started, uh, according to what we've learned from public sources from Israel and Saudi in recent months. And uh, it was uh, September at, uh, at during the UN General Assembly, when both the Israeli Prime Minister talked about the uh, prospect for, for Saudi normalization uh, in the UN, and then the, uh, the, um, the Saudi leadership uh, mentioned that as well. So um, I think there was an attempt by the Israeli leadership to try and broaden the Abraham Accords that were signed in 2020 uh, and, and, and increase the normalization and peace between Israel and, and more moderate Arab countries. And eventually circle back and try and resolve the, the Palestinian issue. Uh, that that attack by Hamas is, is an obvious attempt to, to torpedo that, to sabotage that. Um, my hope is that it, it's only been delayed, that um, it's not off the table. Um, but but I think I think this will be harder to execute now that the the the, 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 the war in Gaza has started. Um, there were there were reactions across the Arab world. Uh, to recent events uh, that, that already, such as the hospital uh, event that happened uh, two days ago, uh, that are going to make it very uh, hard for Arab leaders to, at, the, at least in this moment, to try and and go towards uh, more norm normalization with Israel. But I do hope that that, that will be the ultimate uh, game, because it seems to me more realistic than the other option, uh, which was which was tried a couple of times and, and failed, which is to try and first solve the Palestinian issue and then uh, increase broader normalization across the Arab world. 
a question um specifically for Yoram though if you want to pitch in on the previous question please do to what extent should we understand this as part of a broader war on the west given what's going on um with China and also with Russia well <clears throat> the, if you ask who benefits from uh from what's happened uh, uh Ophir is correctly pointing to uh um anyone who is hostile to uh to normalization and peace with with Israel uh has obviously benefited because you know projects like uh uh connecting connecting uh Israel to to India through a a, a railway line through Saudi Arabia you know which is like a you know tremendous strategic goal of uh, of Israel's are going to be put on hold indefinitely. Um, the Chinese uh, benefit from this probably, probably more than any other, any other actor in the world. Um, the, the, this, the the war in Ukraine is uh, is a tremendous uh, drain on uh, American attention and uh, resources. Uh, by the way, I don't. I don't mean to say that uh, that the Ukrainian cause is, isn't isn't just. It's a just cause, but the problem is that America, despite what many Americans think, uh, has limited limited attention and limited resources. And um, by uh, what we're seeing is kind of a um, a, a a an eruption of um, strategically significant uh, wars. First, the Ukraine, uh, then uh, Azer in Azerbaijan, uh, now in Israel. Uh, I, I I do believe that there is um, uh, a Chinese interest in these wars. That you know, the, I, I I have no evidence that they're directly involved, but the, there is certainly a Chinese interest. The more distracted the United States is, um, the 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 less Americans are capable of preparing for uh, for the most important foreign policy issue to the United States, which is its rivalry with China. Um, many people have been skeptical about the possibility of, uh, of the Chinese uh, uh, beginning an open war, for example, by in invading uh, Taiwan. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that, um, that every one of these conflicts, every day that it goes by and uh, trips of U.S. presidents into various war zones, and and uh, you know, much much as uh, the attention is um, uh, may feel good to many Israelis, the fact is that uh, what what we're watching is America weakening itself with respect to uh, to China and increasing the likelihood that the Chinese will be uh, tempted into uh, into war. Um, that is the you know, that that's the, the direction in which things are going at the moment. So we're running low on time now. So I'm just going to put a question um, or two questions, I should say, um, in reverse order to you. Um, so the first question um, from from one of our viewers here um, is what can we do to help Israel here in the West? Uh, but also to combine this with somebody else's question, which is whether or not you feel that there is any hope for peace between Israel and Palestine. So if we could start with Fanny and just get everybody's closing remarks. First of all, I think the, the best help that you can provide us is combating misinformation. Nothing is more um, devastating right now outside of, of the actual war zone than misinformation and uh, brainwashing propaganda coming from, and I'm sorry for, I'm going to use this, I will try to not use it, but the woke left. Um, they are spreading false information and, and what you can do is really combating that false information and making sure that the information you are sharing is factual. That's, I think, the biggest help that you can do. Um, and sorry, could you please repeat the second question? Um, whether you feel that there's 
the questions were whether you feel there's any hope for um, peace between Israel and Palestine and what people can do to support Israel in the uh, West. Look, I want to believe in peace because I do not want my children to have to serve in another war. I also know that realistically this is not going to happen. This wish is not going to come true. I believe in a two-state solution. I believe that peaceful people should be living next to each other. But I also see that our unilateral withdrawal in 2005 led us nowhere. So I hope for peace, and I do think we need to work towards peace. It is, however, very difficult to talk about peace. Um, just as our Palestinian counterparts, even the West Bank, are justifying war with justifying their movement, um, uh, justifying rape and murder with their movement. So I I hope so that we will have, we will see peace, maybe not in our lifetime, but in, in the further future. Um, and I really, really thank for everyone who has joined in and listened to us. And I also would like to uh, thank uh, Ophir and Yoram. I have learned tremendously from the two of you in this call, and I'm very happy that we got connected. And thank you, Emma, for being a wonderful host. Ophir? So, so in terms of uh, help uh, from the West, uh, I would say two things. I think one, um, as I alluded earlier, academic institutions currently are facing a moral question of whether they will do something about the growing trend of anti-Semitism and the growing intolerance to Israeli and, and Jewish uh, students on campus. And that extends to other civil society organizations. So I think allyship in this moment is important and uh, not just for Jewish organizations, but for any organization uh, who, who cares about uh, you know, having, having an environment uh, that's uh, pluralistic um, to stand up and, and say so. And then, and then uh, the second point is that um, Hamas is a recognized terror organization, but I think there's still there's still steps to take uh, for uh, leaders in countries to recognize that if, if it is like ISIS, then any support for Hamas shouldn't be tolerated. And that extends the spectrum uh, between, you know, uh, uh, rallies that uh, voice things like from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine will be free, uh, and and other types of incitement for what eventually uh, becomes violence against um, Jews and, and Israelis. So I won't go into the policy debate of how to do it, but um, I think it's important to take more action um, around the West. And uh, and I would I would echo on the peace uh, prospects for peace. I would echo what uh, what Fanny said. Um, I, I remain hopeful that you know after this is over. Um, Israel came back to increasing the Abraham Accords trend. And then I remain hopeful that eventually there will be also inclusion of the Palestinian as, as part of that. Uh, but it's, it's hard to think about that in this in this current moment, I agree. Final comments from you, Ram. Well, th there's there's two competing theories of how you get to peace. And we're, we're all familiar with, with both of them. Uh, one theory is uh, is uh, dialogue and commerce and uh, just having having relationships. Um, and uh, the other theory is that peace only happens through overwhelming strength. Uh, the second position is if you want to know why uh, the Abraham Accords happened, uh, it, it it's not because of uh, commerce or human contacts, although those those are obviously necessary, but it's primarily because uh, Israel is a very very strong power, a power a strong country in the region, and uh, there are many Arab countries that that would like an alliance for for their their own reasons, and I, I don't mean to be cynical about it. I think that that's completely natural and human that uh, every country, every people has its own interests. And uh, to advance those interests, they they want allies who are strong. Um, the the conversations are they're good at a human level, but I, my experience is the same as Fanny's experience that uh, that um, uh, individual relationships um, uh, don't don't often do not 
succeed in surviving uh, these kinds of shifts in political interest and political events. Uh, so my my suggestion is that we continue to understand Israel is a strong country, but it lives in a very, very difficult part of the world. And in general, the uh, strategic environment is getting more difficult. Uh, war is, is returning to the globe. And so um, anything that, uh, that you and the audience can do to strengthen Israel, I, I, I mean, I think the the, the point the points are obvious and you know there, there's uh, you can strengthen Israel if, if you're you're Jewish by by uh, uh, moving to Israel and serving in the army uh, if if you're not going to do that and you're Jewish or or Christian or or anyone else um, then uh, there there's uh, quite a few organizations that have been set up at the moment to uh, to provide um, uh, equipment and supplies and uh, uh, various kinds of relief for for the Israeli soldiers. Um, if you're uh, if you don't know how to uh, how how to how to give to those organizations, then you can uh, contact Emma and and uh, I'll I'll help her with um, uh, some possible addresses for 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 donating. And finally, uh, to reinforce what Fanny said, the the diplomatic war is an information war. And every single one of you uh, is uh, uh, is potentially an actor in 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 that warfare, and we're very grateful to everyone who takes the time to to help us help us with that. Th thank you, Fear and Fanny and Emma, for this uh, uh, lovely conversation. And I will post mm -hmm. a, a, a thread on Twitter with any of those links that Yo Ram has mentioned. If he sends those to me, I'll make sure that there's a, a long thread detailing all of the different organizations that you might be able to donate money to to help. Uh, so thank you very much, Fanny, Ophir and Yo Ram. And thank you, everyone who is in the audience who we can't see, but we know that you're there. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this webinar today. Um, and we will imagine the, the customary round of applause for our speakers. Okay. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you at another webinar soon. Mm -hmm.